Welcome to the Deep Dive Spirituality Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Brian Russell, and today it's my privilege to have a repeat guest, Dr. Kevin Watson. Kevin is the Director of Academic Growth and Formation at Asbury Seminary, and most profoundly, he's an expert on the history of Methodism and on the holiness movement, as well as even specializing in Wesley's theology of discipleship. You're going to find this episode both inspirational and deeply practical. Kevin's going to talk about Methodism, past, present, and future. And one of the recurring themes that we'll continue to come back to is the importance of that core Wesleyan doctrine of entire sanctification, holiness of heart and life, perfect love, Christian perfection, the second blessing, however you want to describe it. We're going to continue to return back to this. I know that I was blessed just listening to Kevin answer my questions, and I consider this one of the best episodes I've recorded yet or so far on the Deep Dive podcast. Before we get to the interview, I want to announce that in December 2024, I'm going to be uh, releasing a new monthly Deep Dive spirituality update. I'm going to pull together the best resources that I find on spiritual formation, biblical interpretation, spiritual leadership and formation, as well as missional imagination. I'll also be sharing my latest content with you directly in your inbox. There's a link in the show notes, or you can simply go to Brian Russell, PhD, slash newsletter. Also, I'd invite you, if you want to help get the word out, especially if you love this interview I'm doing with Kevin, would you like like it, subscribe, leave a review, and even better, share it with your friends as we try to get the word out. Again, thank you for listening, and let's jump into the conversation that I had with Kevin Watson, Methodism Past, Present, and Future. Welcome back to the podcast, Kevin. It's so great to see you. Thanks for having me. It's good to be back. Well, since the last time you were on back in uh, 2020, and I'll link to the episode, you've published two books, uh, Perfect Love in 2021, and now in 2024, you have this, your new book, your latest book, Doctrine, Spirit, and Discipline, A History of the Wesleyan Tradition in the United States. Um, congrats on both of those. Let me ask a quick question about A Perfect Love. Uh, you've been part of the conversation on trying to I don't know, resuscitate or bring back into Methodism Mm -hmm. uh, the doctor of of, uh, holiness of heart and life or perfect love. Um, What's your sense of the impact of your book and and even conversations that you're hearing in Methodist circles about entire sanctification and what role it's going to play in the future vitality of Methodism? Yeah, I've been really encouraged um, by the, I think my favorite part about the impact of the book has just been personal emails from people who read the book and oftentimes they're sort of like, I was struggling with this or I didn't like this part or, you know, those kind of things. And, um, but that somewhere along the way, the Lord sort of like grabbed them and, and started to, you know, to kind of, uh, shake them from their complacency or their sort of, uh, slumber. And I've gotten several testimonies, even to an experience of entire sanctification, which is, is, is just so encouraging and, and, um, exciting to, to read and hear about. So that's been my favorite part. I think there has been a broader kind of awareness in, in the church of, for, for folks who haven't, where it hasn't become that personal and kind of like reevaluation of their own faith journey, this just the sense of like, okay, I may not really like that this is a part of my tradition, but it, I'm convinced that it is. And so I need to grapple with it in some way. And so I think even that's just been really healthy that amongst the people called Methodists, the Wesleyan family broadly, I think there is a kind of renewed sense of of like urgency and engagement with what does it mean to be Wesleyan? What does it mean to be following in the footsteps of of John Wesley and those who came after him? What does it mean to be Methodist? And and you you haven't sort of adequately wrestled with that until you uh, actually talk about the doctrine of holiness and entire sanctification. Good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, one of your endorsers uh, of your latest book, Doug Strong, uh, he called uh, doctrine, spirit, and and discipline, quote, an essential corrective to the overall narrative of the Methodist legacy in the United States. Um, I found that really interesting as a a lifelong Methodist. I was wondering, what is the backstory and and like, what what, what were you trying to correct when you wrote the book? Yeah, I think where my mind goes with that is I think that there was a sense of uh, 
Methodism, the this sort of historical narrative has almost always been told by people in the kind of mainline branch of Methodism. And it almost always has been focused on the mainline branch of Methodism. So you might sort of say this group of people popped up, but then they kind of fall off the radar. The, the narrative doesn't really carry them forward as a part of the tradition. Uh, and so that's part of what I'm trying to do in the book is to intentionally tell a kind of pan Wesleyan history. Uh, so several years ago, I think it was actually when I was first starting to be interested in uh, exploring the possibility of PhD work. I was a part of a, a group of folks that Hal Knight had gathered together to really talk about kind of the Wesleyan holiness family as more than, you know, what I had really known. And so got to be a part of a broader group of folks. And there was a shared kind of sense from those scholars that we, we haven't really like the history, our history hasn't been told as a whole family history, but it's, and I think part of that for me in terms of corrective is that, um, United Methodist seminaries tended just to have the most resources and availability and it's, they weren't necessarily doing anything wrong. It's, it's natural for you to kind of study your own part of the family tree. Uh, and so there just was a lot more scholarly resourcing given to, um, you know, that part of the story in particular. So I think it's been told pretty well and pretty thoroughly. Um, the, and then there are denominational histories of most of the denominations, if not all of them in in the, in the book, but uh, not much that tries to to tell the story of like these folks in these different parts of the the family actually did interact with each other. They had relationships with each other and awareness that other things were happening. So it's trying to to kind of uh, sort of say there's a there there in the beginning, the doctrine, spirit, and discipline with which we first set out. We can identify what the tradition is, uh, but then there's also a, a value in in kind of tracing that through a, a family and not just uh, you know one particular part of the denomination or the the family tree. In, in um, Methodism, and you, you, met, you mentioned mainline Methodism, and so, you know, mainline Methodism right now, it's been through a, um, a rebooting time, I think we, would be the kindest way to actually describe it with the recent um, um, fracturing into, well, the, it's still the United Methodist Church, and then you have the GMC, and then a lot of churches have kind of just been independent and with some different networks and such. Um, what's your sense... Again, this may be too close to everything to answer, but like, what's your sense right now of the future of Wesley's descendants, at least as the, amongst the people that have been um, formerly United Methodist and before that the Methodist Episcopal and the various names it had? And will there ever be like a big tent Methodism ever again? And what might it look like if there would be? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I I tend to think. So I think I think the reader of Doctrine, Spirit, and Discipline would would find that my the place I'm situated in this narrative is that Big Tent Methodism is kind of an invention in the 20th century. It's not something that really has a a previous history. So one of my favorite examples to illustrate that is in Wesley's theology, he talks about uh, Catholic spirit, and in the 20th century, um, kind of liberal Protestant academics reinterpreted Catholic spirit to be something that was internal to Methodism itself. So really it should have been Methodist spirit instead of Catholic spirit. Cause what Wesley was doing in Catholic spirit was saying Christians shouldn't like anathematize each other uh, based on uh, doctrinal and, and practical differences that mean they can't worship in the same body, but they should still be able to, to parse the distinctions between essentials and non-essentials and say, we can't be in the same church because we practice infant baptism and you don't. But that doesn't mean that I have to anathematize you and say that you're not actually a follower of Jesus. So trying to make those kind of decisions. And I think that comes largely, it's it's really kind of enshrined with the creation of the United Methodist Church in 1968. Um, I think bigger picture, like my, my own interest is in the, my sense is that there are kind of major shifts that are happening in uh, the dominant culture, which is, that could be its own podcast. That's, that's a, a big t term that's complicated, but just painting with broad brushstrokes um, in the West. And I think it's, it's come to the U S like the, the nominal Christianity I think is dying. And so I think there's a, there isn't really space culturally for uh, kind of a s somewhat commitment to the gospel. It doesn't help you in your life. If you're a real estate agent to belong to, a large church to, to try to make contacts and things like that in the same way that it did in um, a previous era. And so I think that one of the things that we'll see happening in the Wesleyan family broadly is uh, kind of counting the cost of the gospel, commitment to the gospel. 
uh, and and those who uh, will will really thrive in, in the coming decades and generations will be people who are kind of have a deeper radical commitment and even a willingness to suffer for the faith, as opposed to what I think the the previous desires, again, really broad brushstrokes, but the typical desire of mainline Methodism culturally is to kind of be a cultural chaplain, to kind of meet with the, the culture on its own terms uh, and and be winsome and serve it. And I I just don't think the culture, the dominant culture is really asking for um, the church to be a chaplain anymore. And so it's more uh, a kind of countercultural witness that is uh, more like radical evangelism and, and a call to conversion and those kind of things, which were, were less prevalent, I think, in uh, kind of the, the heyday of the UMC in particular. But I'm a historian, and so we don't make predictions very well, so that could all be wrong. No, that, that that's interesting, and yeah, and, and let me just ask a follow up, um, and just bring us back to the doctrine of holiness. Then, um, a lot of the movements that split off, kind of the original thread that of the Methodist Episcopal Church. Again, there were other reasons involved, but a lot of these were holiness denominations: the Free Methodists, mm-hmm. the Wesleyans, um, even the Nazarenes, started by a former Methodist uh, pastor. Is the doctrine of entire sanctification? How does that fit in? Would, does that not fit into a Big Ten ultimately, or is that into a distinctive that you have to be kind of like you said, um, radically cult- countercultural to embrace a doctrine like that? What would you say? Yeah, I think I, I think I would say that's probably correct. Uh, so a, a couple of things come to mind. One, someone like B.T. Roberts, the founder of the Free Methodist Church, he actually explicitly argues, and this was one of the the key moments for me in getting to writing Doctrine, Spirit, and Discipline was I wrote a a previous book called Older New School Methodism, where I was really arguing that in in this period, this is the first like major break in the Methodist family over theology, over like the meaning of Methodism theologically. And Roberts is saying we're we're abandoning the doctrine of holiness, which is who we are. And his contrast is basically worldliness. So it's sort of like we can we can pursue the kind of the pure gospel as it's actually it's actually taught in scripture, or we can pursue like in, in his his famous old a uh, new school Methodism essay that's the reason he was expelled from the Methodist Church. Um, he actually talks about like that instead of calling people to repent of sin and to calling them out of the world into fellowship and, and faithfulness to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we invite them to grab bags and oyster fairs. And these are just sort of middle, upper middle class social activities um, that aren't, they're not, they're called different things today, but be, you know, it'd be like someone talking about a country club church instead of, um, you know, and, and so there's that kind of, you know, critique is, is in BT Roberts and it's because of him seeing Methodism kind of leaving aside the, the doctrine of holiness in its own teaching. And I think that the doctrine of holiness itself, it's always, it ought to always be grounded in the teaching of scripture and scripture is, is speaking in ways that are sort of uh, causing the person to make decisions about their commitment to the ways of the world or to like Romans, you know, eight talks about life in the spirit versus life in the flesh. And um, is creating that kind of contrast. And so, so I think, I think it is difficult to, you know, to have that be uh, sort of something that starts here and then gets bigger from there. But instead it tends, I think, to, to be calling for someone to, you know, to walk the narrow way um, as opposed to the wide path. Good. And if you're going to look, um, and, and you can paint with broad brushstrokes on this answer, this is a, another, probably can be a podcast, but if, if you're going to lay out essentially major challenges uh, to a revival of a vibrant Methodism in the 21st century. And we can frame the challenges both inside inside the, the church itself or churches or outside. What would, what would be some of the big challenges in, internal and external that are perhaps hindering the, that deeper work that God wants to do through the people called Methodists? Yeah, I think the first challenge, I think this is one I'm actually pretty optimistic is, is, going to be addressed is already being addressed. And that is, I think, just having a foundation of who who we actually are. Uh, so first, there's an awareness of, you know, the challenge of biblical literacy. Do we actually know the text? Do we know the scriptures? Do we know the story of salvation? That's first and foremost. Um, do we have a, a basic grounding in the Christian faith? Um, it's always important. I think because my expertise is in Methodism and especially Wesley and his theology, 
um, people can sometimes think I'm trying to make disciples of John Wesley, which I'm not interested in at all. Actually, I just think Wesley was really good at making disciples of Jesus. And so he's a good model for, for how to make disciples of Jesus. So the foundation of the Christian faith. And then on that, what does it actually mean to be a Methodist, which is one of the basic things. I'm, that's why the book is titled Doctrine, Spirit, and Discipline. I think it gives us three cult, threefold formula for what it means to be Methodist. So, and I think that's the thing that I see a lot of people in the Wesleyan family today actually intentionally working on. And I think in a lot of ways, that's why I, I've been able to publish some of the things I've published. There's been a market established for uh, kind of the the sort of, you know, back to the source type move. Like what what is the doctrine that Methodism first set out by or set out with? And um, people are usually, I haven't gotten a whole lot of arguments. In fact, I can't think of any time that when I've read the quote from Thoughts Upon Methodism, where Wesley says, I'm not afraid that people called Methodists should either exist, cease to exist in Europe or America, but I'm only afraid they cease, that they would exist as a dead sect, totally butchering it. I should have had it in front of me to read. Um, but, you know, he's saying, I don't, I'm not worried whether Methodism will exist. I'm, whether, I'm worried whether it will exist as like a rotting corpse. Like, will it actually have like spirit breathed life? in it? Will it have power? Will it have strength? Or will it just be kind of putrid and and there? Uh, and and he says the, the way to gauge that is these three things, whether it you know, adheres to the doctrine, spirit, and discipline with which it first set out. Um, and that quote has always been really interesting to me because Wesley knew a time when there was no Methodism. So he can remember when there wasn't Methodism. And by the end of his life, he's like, I don't, I'm not worried about whether it'll be around or not. That That's always astounding to me. I can't imagine um, you know, seeing something 10 years ago start. And by the time that I'm in my early eighties saying, you know, this is going to be not just in the state or the town that I started it in, um, but I think it's going to be in these two continents. Like it's going to continue. It's pretty, pretty incredible. Um, and I think that, that you, you kind of see those, uh, no one has ever said when I read that quote, like, I just don't think that's important. I've never had that reaction of somebody saying, well, why should we care where we started? People are actually generally very interested in that. So that's really encouraging to me. Um, I think the harder one is, and the one I'm, I'm probably a little bit more pessimistic about is I've, I have been thinking quite a bit about kind of exegeting our own cultural moment. Um, if, if you don't, th- this is a, a sort of simple way of saying it, but if you don't know what time it is, then the way that you respond will be wrong. Like it won't be effective. It won't work. And so this takes us pretty far stream of Methodism, but there's a, a guy whose work has gotten quite a bit of attention lately. He's just sort of like a public intellectual. His name's Aaron Wren. And he wrote this piece in First Things uh, several years ago called The Three Worlds of Evangelicalism. And he he's basically making a chronological argument that there's a period of time where the, the culture felt positive towards evangelical Christian faith. Uh, then there was a shift in like the nineties to 2014 of feeling neutral towards Christian faith. And then from 2014 on um, he says we're in negative world so that the dominant culture actually thinks that evangelical Christian faith is dangerous. It's, it's wrong. It, it like needs to be resisted and sort of uh, pushed away from positions of elite power and influence in particular um, and I, I think he's right about that. I think we are living in negative world. Um, and that that what that means is, as the senior pastor at Asbury Church, um, Reverend Andrew Forrest here puts it, um, how are we going to reach the people who hate us? That's the, that's the evangelistic challenge is um, that we, it doesn't help to not recognize that they hate us, but that it doesn't change what our mission and calling is. It's still to reach the people who aren't here yet, um, even if they're actually more um, antagonistic and opposed to us than they were 25 to 50 years ago. So I think that's the big challenge is it's not, the challenge isn't that we're in negative world. If I'm right about that, that's just, that is what it is. The challenge I see kind of in the the Wesleyan family today is I see a lot of people leading in denominational life whose strategies look to me like neutral world strategies, which just won't work. If we're in negative world, they will be failed strategies. And I think I'm tempted to come back to holiness again, because what you just said, I think that's a really interesting, I wrote down that, how do we reach people who hate us? You know, one option is to put a bunch of memes up on Twitter um, and uh, throw it right back on folks, which seems to be what um, at least social media culture does back and forth, and you get this polarization. Doesn't a doctrine of, of entire sanctification, if it's actually a legitimate 
reality in a person's life create so much love in a person's heart that you can actually somehow love the very people that hate you? I mean, tangibly and like, is not the doctrine of holiness the answer to that question? I'm just, again, I don't know how you, I don't, I'm simplifying, but like, how, how would you just respond to that? We have to out love people. I mean, tangibly, yeah, the skin in the game. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're right. I mean, I think, I think to, to thrive in negative world as a follower of Jesus, you, you have to, you have to be radically transformed by Jesus. Like it won't work any other way. Um, strategies, self-help strategies, you know, discipline, um, you know, whatever the thing is that, that you might reach to as a plan, it's, it, Jesus is the only way to actually like win long term, and that doesn't mean the other things are bad or not useful or helpful. It just means Jesus has to be at the center. If anything else is at the center, um, it won't work because they're the pull towards compromise, the pull towards um, respectability, the the pull towards comfort. Like these are all understandable kind of normal things that humans want. Uh, it's just that they shouldn't always be ultimate. They shouldn't always be kind of in first place. Sometimes we should be willing to accept discomfort for something that's greater and more important. So we've been at Asbury, I've been surprised, but um, we've been talking quite a bit about suffering as a part of the, the a valid part of the Christian life. Like it's, it's actually inescapable. And, and the reason we've been doing it isn't actually because we're trying to figure out how to be relevant in this moment. It's because we've been preaching through Romans and Paul just talks about suffering as a part of the Christian life intentionally. And, um, you know, I, I don't think I could have said this before our congregational study. I'd read the passage many times, but, you know, the the, the sort of well-known to Wesleyan's assurance passage in Romans 8, 16, um, the spirit witnesses with our spirit that we're God's children. Right after that, it talks about, you know, that w- provided that we suffer for, with him, that we also be glorified with him. Like there's actually a kind of eight, Romans 8, 17 goes right into that the servant is not greater than his master. Like, and, and for me, the, the thing that's just like hidden that it's been so exciting and helpful in times that I've experienced of suffering is like the gospel is that we get what Jesus gets. Uh, but that actually means we get what Jesus gets. Like the cross wasn't a strategy for Jesus to go through. So no one else had to, that we all get to go around suffering just to glorification. It's actually, it is in some sense, like the pattern that we, are asked, Jesus says, take up your cross and follow, right? Like there's, there are, there are examples. And and that doesn't mean that we um, imprudently like pursue suffering, but it does mean that it's, it's wrong um, to talk about suffering as uh, sort of like a, uh, the, the opposite of faithfulness in the Christian life. Sometimes faithfulness actually is walking through suffering. Um, and I think that's what holiness looks like too, to your point that um, there's a kind of purging. Sometimes it's a part of a deep understanding of holiness uh, and deep surrender and those kind of things where um, we really are able to, after being kind of emptied of our own selfish desires, we're able to truly love the Lord um, and and love what he loves. And, and that's, that's other people, even when, when they're unlovable, right. When they're difficult to love in terms of how they treat us. Yeah. I remember um, Bob Tuttle and uh, I wasn't here to witness this, but I've, um, I can't remember if he told me this story himself or it was some students, but, and I'm going to get the context wrong, but I know it was part of an, a trip to Israel. Mm. And for whatever reason, Dr. Tuttle got into a, um, I guess, a rather heated conversation with an imam uh, that was really uncomfortable. And they, in the, in the um, imam ended up yelling at um, Bob Tuttle. And I think it got, un- this might have even been on an airplane. So it was very awkward mm. and people were getting concerned and it was, and, and again, this wasn't like insane that anybody got arrested or anything, but it was obviously something that could have bubbled over and just legitimate arg- with an argument. And, and Bob Tuttle, you know, I, th- I think I'm going to get this right, sort of ended the conversation by giving the most audacious statement I think I've ever heard. He basically just told the other person they were having a dispute over religion over <laughs> Jesus. And I, I think Tuttle was said, uh, if you can love me, so this is the guy he was arguing with, if you can love me more than I love you right now, I'll become a Muslim. Um, and it, that was like drop, you know, that's like a walk off home run in that mm-hmm. conversation. And again, I'm not yeah. shooting it, taking shots at any religion in that statement. But I mean, to me, that's the ultimate power. If if you're in a, con- if, if you're going to embrace suffering, that puts you in the position where 
just like Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. If I can, if you can love me more than I love you right now, um, I'll I'll convert. Um, but yeah. I, but and and so again, I'll just share that in response to what you said. And I think also it is. I mean, if if you read the scriptures, there's no way that you can't um, that you don't come face to face with these suffering passages. You just have to have the eyes to see them because who wants to actually yeah. read that stuff? <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. Um, but yeah, but thank you, thank you for that. Um, I want to ask some a question about the Global Methodist Church now as a as a piece of um of, of this conversation. Yeah. Um. You, you know, you 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 have some experience, and you've even had you know you you've, you've had some leadership um in a sense of thought leadership with in the whole conversation of the GMC. From your expertise in history, and especially your pan Wesleyan views, under you know, thinking about Salvation Army, Nazarenes, um. Free Methodist Wesleyans and again other groups that I probably don't even know of. Um, what can the GMC learn from those groups? These past groups that have split off from the bigger mainline piece. Uh, like, what what are lessons, maybe pros and cons, that you would hope the GMC would learn from past breakoffs? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I think I, the first thing I would say is uh, a story comes to mind of, of something that that someone shared with me who was um, in pretty high kind of level leadership in the GMC and and um, and kind of ended up stepping out. And their their like summary was that they felt like uh, the the narrative had been sort of new wineskins for new wine, um, but that their experience was too often for them that really what was happening was it was the people who thought if they had been in charge in the UMC, things would be okay. And like, that was, that was the challenge. Um, and I think I would say like the GMC definitely needs to create new wine skins, um, for new wine. Like it, 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 I think in a lot of ways, um, they can't have, of course you can take this too far, but they can't, they should be pressing on the side of openness to innovation and change and, and those kind of things um, on one level. On the other level, uh, I, I feel pretty strongly that, that the GMC should, should never do things to try to preemptively respond to a critique from the United Methodist Church. I think um, there just needs to be a period of time where both churches do what they think is the best and most faithful thing. And, and Lord willing, at some point there will be opportunity for reconciliation, but it's just clearly not, not going to happen any, anytime soon. And um, there was a, well, I, I won't go there, but I, I think those are, those are two key pieces. Um, and then I, the other thing I'd say is, and, and it's kind of in, in line with this, um, the global Methodist church would do well to pay attention to kind of the, um, the data in terms of the growth and development of these traditions I think every single tradition that split off from the mainline branch of Methodism experienced radical growth um, in its first generation because it actually was seeking to adhere to something really specific and particular, like a specific particular vision for the Christian life. Um, and when that happens, you know, the, I'm thinking of the Roger Finke uh, and Rodney Stark, I think I got their names correct. They're, they wrote this book, The Churching of America, that's, I think, just a classic, where they have this tagline, the main line is always on the decline. And that it's a sociological study that in, in the history of religion in America, the sort of groups that are outside of the cultural center are actually the ones that maybe paradoxically grow the most uh, radically, the most rapidly, um, often exponentially. And in their book, the Methodist Episcopal Church is the the best example of that from 1776 to 1850 when it grows from I think it's like two and a half percent of religious adherents to 34 percent from 1776 to 1850 and um, I think it's one of the fastest growths of of the church in the history of Christianity um, because in 1850 the next largest group according to their data are Baptists and it's 20 percent so Methodism is not just the biggest, it's like way bigger than anybody else. And it had been the smallest um, of the Protestant denominations they measure and in, in the, you know, at the start date. So it's a, it's a astonishing radical rapid growth. And it's also not coincidental that during that period of time, Methodists are generally a ragtag bunch of nobodies. Like they're not famous. They're not being, they're not running for president or being elected president. They're not postmaster general. They're not generals of the army. Like they're, they're, they're on the fringes of society. 
Um, and they're, they're just kind of like sold out holiness people that don't care about getting made fun of. They, they will, you know, go into rough places to evangelize and, and sometimes even, um, get roughed up for their, their efforts and, um, those kind of things. And, um, I, th- I think that, that we can't go back and be frontier Methodist circuit riding preachers, but I do think we can ask the Holy Spirit to give us such a conviction for the gospel of Jesus Christ that we are willing to be less respectable. Um, if it might mean that some people come to know who Jesus is and come to experience salvation through his name. Like, I think that's a, a kind of key piece, um, not, not pursuing like what, what is the cult? I think the question that Methodism has asked way too much in the like mid 20th century to the present is what does the culture want to hear from me and how can I avoid offending the culture instead of just simply asking the Lord, what does faithfulness look like right now? And how can I be faithful? Um, and then just trusting the Lord with with working that out. I think that's a, a place where um, the GMC would, and I think they're doing a pretty good job of it from from the vantage point that I have of, um, you know, being willing to to sort of uh, just do the best they can to to testify to Christ crucified and risen. I, I love those two questions. I'm I'm uh, that that was that was that was awesome, Kevin. Uh, something like um yeah 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 I'm I'm gonna. That was good. That was really good. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to pull that clip out and um, that, that, that was awesome. That was really good. Um, uh, I was trying to write it down. Um, um, yeah. You just got me, <laughs> you got me speechless now that those were, that was, that was two fantastic questions. So thank you for that. Um, Praise um, God. Yeah, man. Um, so I'm going to start wrapping things up here a little bit, but let me, yeah. let me ask you um, what, what are the, what what are pres- what are some prescriptive takeaways and, and maybe you've shared a couple of these already that you hope present day Wesleyans I mean that in the big biggest sense of the word would take to heart from your book. Yes, I think one is this kind of. I'll, I'll keep this one short because I've kind of already said it in different ways. But I hope they would have uh, people would come away with the sense of like. Methodists are kind of a strange and peculiar people, but it's awesome. Like the Lord has used it. it. Like basically that we should be proud of, not in a sinful way, but like we should cherish and treasure our uniqueness and our strangeness as something to be stewarded, as something to be lifted up and, and that kind of thing. And then I hope within that, the the sort of two particulars are that this audacious optimism of what the grace of God can do in the lives of every single person the Lord creates, that we would just become awed by that and, and and excited to share. Like, I just, I want to see like people just completely smitten by like, whatever it is, wherever you're stuck, like Jesus is the answer. He's able, he's willing to, to do more than we can ask or imagine. Like, I want to see a generation. And I think Gen Z has this written all over them. And I'm excited to see they're, they, they're sort of like stamped for radical commitment to something. And I pray that um, the Lord sends revival to to give them commitment to the gospel, um, as I've I've seen with many already. Um, and then the flip side is, I think, um, and it's related to it is is kind of reclaiming this this understanding of of discipline as a a structured kind of communal pursuit of this audacious optimism of deep radical transformation by Jesus um, through community. And I think there's it's it's not the goal isn't to create a program that's a silver bullet. Um, I think the class and band meetings both are still relevant in our day, and that's why I've written about them in other places. Um, but also, I, I think a lot about spiritual parenting and kind of deci- like life on life disciple making. Um, and one of the things that I that has kind of been haunting me, and I've been wanting to to work at in, in whatever small way I can, is that people who know how to make disciples, they they actually bless and provide covering spiritually for the people that are coming behind them. And one of the like core fruit of that that you see is that they delight when the person below them actually surpasses them in ministry. Like it's like it is it's like there's nothing better than that if you're a spiritual parent than seeing your spiritual kids surpass you, do more than you were able to do in your ministry, have more authority, have more spiritual power and so forth, greater gifting. Um and I think that the but the the part that has haunted me is that the opposite is that people who are, have not been spiritually parented or discipled well, they tend to castrate those who are under them and sort of basically try to remove their spiritual authority so that all they can do is serve them and kind of prop them up. And I think that's 
some of what we've seen and some of the generational tension and the culture and, and for example, secular politics um, and those kind of things is a lack of understanding of, of how these kind of things really work. And it's because it's the church that kind of has this, the church that stewards this, but uh, the place where it's the most um, grievous to me is when you actually see the same dynamic within the church, when you see leaders and ecclesial bodies who are actually unable to effectively parent and provide spiritual covering for those who are coming underneath them and instead, um, you know, crush them, crush their spirits, crush their, their passion and gifts for ministry because they just want them. They want to squeeze everything out of them. They can get to make themselves look better. I think that happens all too often and it's tragic when it does. It's, it's also, it's often the reason why folks who have been called into ministry by the Lord burn out early in their ministries because they, they weren't, they didn't have people who were pouring into them and preparing them to go surpass them in, in the work they were doing. Um, and I'll just give like one, one brief shout out to, to the, on those lines, but um, the GMC's election of, of Carolyn Moore to the Episcopacy, I think was a stroke of genius because Bishop Moore is one of those people who I see as like, she just has spiritual parenting, being a spiritual mother, like all over her, um, all over her life. And she has, has clear fruit that has born from that. And, and it's a, um, a real positive example and witness. And for me, it was really powerful. There was a, a conference I was at recently where um, she is the first time I was around her since she had become a bishop and elected to the episcopacy. And um, and I, I felt like there was a like I could almost sense spiritually like a tangible way in which she had been given greater authority and that it was actually providing greater covering spiritually for um, the people who were under her ministry. And that kind of thing is I think one of the most underrated things in contemporary Christianity, because when you're spiritually covered, there really is a freedom. It's like having a bodyguard. There's gives you the ability to let your guard down and do what the Lord is calling you to do and trust that someone else has your back um, who's ahead of you. Um, and when you're uncovered spiritually, there's a, there's an anxiety, there's a, a worry about whether you're going to, the next mistake that you make is going to be the reason it is going to be fatal and, and that kind of thing. And, um, so that's, that's something I hope that, um, you know, is, is a takeaway too. Wow. Yeah, that, that was fantastic. You know, I'm, I'm hoping everyone is still with us all the way to this point. Cause these last, uh, 10, 15 minutes have just been, um, um, yeah, my heart's been strangely warmed and just remembering, <laughs> um, I mean, <laughs> this will sound like a heresy, but I'm just going to say it anyway. Um, usually when we think of, um, mentoring we think of jesus mentoring the disciples and you know then and, and yeah we want to be jesus and mentor disciples and obviously jesus is a good model for this but i'm also the language that you're talking about of what a really mentor does that's john the baptist language right mm -hmm. he must i must become lesser he must be great mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I, and i'm going to be a i'm going to be a voice crying in the wilderness i'm not going to be a name Mm -hmm. And there's such a huge mm -hmm. difference. Do I want to make a name for myself or do I want to be a voice that points to something else and how can yeah. we model that? So I just, I love just what you said. And, uh, cause I, uh, yeah, I think, um, every pastor and I'm a biblical scholar, so I love preaching. I love teaching. I love all that stuff. But again, I, I'm hundred percent with you. I love your language, a structured community, not an oppressive, not a cult, a structured community that gives yeah. people lanes bumpers on the bowling lanes i guess that um mm. allows us to grow in holiness and allows people to grow into the people that god created them to be and then has the courage to let that group get even better than it was when we ran things so it's not even my i don't want to like we don't need a legacy we just yeah. need <laughs> to, yeah. to create this this next generation so uh, again i'm i'm getting religious now i love it so it's uh so so thank you i think i'm i think i'm gonna stop right there because i mean i don't know how you could have said anything more profound than you just did in the last 15 minutes i hope people get a hold of your book um uh, well, yeah. What 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 are your hopes? What are your big hopes? Like, you know, let's say you were, you know, I'm I'm 55. I'm, I forget you're 40 something. I guess so. So let's say we make it. We both make it for. I make it to 100. So you're 90 or whatever the difference is between us. And so, what are we talking about if everything just goes spectacular the next 45 years? Yeah, I think I, I think my hope is that, um, yeah, like. One thing I've noticed that's encouraging to me is there's an openness to the Holy Spirit that is new um, across like a broader section of, of the church. Um, people who like Rod Dreher has this new book out and it's clearly very vulnerable for him to share kind of from some places of, of personal experience, but he, he does it in a way that it feels like maybe he couldn't have done five years ago or something even. 
Um, and so I just think there's this like, and that, that's just, that is, all that is, is anecdotal, um, you know, in terms of a broader thing that I, I see and ex- am experiencing. And it, it's, that is so exciting to me. So I, I think, I, I think what we're going to talk about is like, man, like, can, can you believe that what we used to think of as church was like an imposter and like, we've gotten to live the real thing the last several decades of our lives. Like, where the church became a family where people actually were contending for each other in the faith, contending for each other's children and parents and extended families and and friends and neighbors and, and seeing the Lord bring people into the kingdom through radical conversion um, and, and the blessing that comes from that. And, um, and I think that I really do. I'm, I'm actually deeply convinced. I'm not, it's, it's something that doesn't feel like hopeful in the sense of like wishful. It's more like expectant, like, I think we're going to be just amazed and exultant at the leaders the Lord raises up for his church that are are younger than us that just kind of like, isn't, isn't this awesome? I think there's going to be a generation of leaders who, who saw the, like the problems with uh, celebrity culture, that kind of thing online. And, um, and, but also are given like power and authority to function in the same kind of way. So they're sort of like, they've died to self and then can actually lead farther than some of the uh, the places where we've we've seen kind of I think judgment on the church and and mistakes that have been made from the past where people maybe sometimes shifted from yeah I, I want my kingdom more than I want to build build the Lord's kingdom or be used by Him to to do His work and so I think we'll be sitting in rocking chairs on the front porch talking about like you know these uh, how awesome the kids are and you know just how fun it is to. Um, to to be honestly, I think it'll be like we're under their spiritual authority and their spiritual covering, and it'll just be such a blessing to be in the shade of of the the trees the Lord has grown through them. Amen. So good, so good. Um, what's next for you? What do you, do you have another book going, or like what's what? Where do you think your where's your research taking you right now? Yeah, I'm currently working on. Um, I'm I have the editorial duties for one of the bicentennial edition of John Wesley's works volumes. I'm doing half of volume fifteen. And uh, it's uh, because God has a sense of humor. I'm doing the the essays that are like Wesley's political writings, um, which is probably like, you know, if there had been like a lottery, that would have been at the close to the bottom of what I would have chosen. But it's been really challenging in a good way to read these things. And um, it's been personally uh, growing for me to see someone like John Wesley grappling with the role of politics in the Christian life um, and um, yeah, and just, these are, it's, it's some of his more kind of famous, like tracks, like there's his writing on slavery and, um, his home address, the American colonies and, um, some of those things are in there. And so I've been working to track down scripture references and, you know, appropriate, the kind of things you do for a critical edition in terms of notation, but also getting to know them well enough that I can step back and provide some helpful introductory commentary, hopefully for people to, to be able to, to step in and read them, um, read them to digest them well on, on their own terms. So it's been a real challenge. I haven't done work like that much. Um, and it's, it's been, uh, hard, but fun at the same time. That's good. And, and, and let people know, uh, where they can, uh, find more about you, like what's your website. And if folks want to get in touch with you and learn a little bit more and read some of your, uh, your, your contemporary writings online, where, what's the best place for people to connect with you, Kevin? Yeah, I typically, most of my online writing is just on my own website, which is kevinmwatson.com. And uh, I'm also on uh, some social media. I don't, I'm not super active on it anymore for the reasons you kind of alluded to. Um, Social media is, the algorithms clearly are designed to, to prefer negativity and anger and those kind of things. Um, But I'm, I'm, I'm on Twitter or X, whatever it's called and Facebook and Instagram and those kind of things. But um, great, great. I, I have a presence there, but not a super active one. Well, that's good. Well, again, I want to thank you for being my guest. This is, um, yeah, this has been really fun for me. Um, really. And I knew I was, I've always enjoyed speaking with you and yeah, this was, this was awesome. It's blessed me and um, I'm grateful for the chance to have you back on. So thank you for your ministry. Thank you for your friendship and thank you for your contributions to the kingdom. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. Thanks for having me again. And thank you to everyone listening all the way to the end of this week's episode of the Deep Dive Spirituality Conversations podcast. You can check out all the things that Kevin referenced in the show notes. And until next time, live by faith, be known by love, and be a voice of hope to others.